Hello, Blogging Heads Nation. Uh, welcome to the latest issue of Dresbert. Uh, I am Daniel Dresner. I'm a professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I write spoiler alerts for the Washington Post. And I'm Heather Hurlbert, and I run the New Models of Policy Change Project here at New America. And we are here to talk about uh, recent foreign policy events and a few domestic foreign policy events. And uh, the most significant one from the last week, uh, although much attention was devoted to Syria, I would argue, was the announcement that uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has been signed, um, which means that it will eventually be up for a vote before Congress. Uh, and I believe there was a certain Democratic presidential candidate that weighed in on TPP. So I'm actually, I'm tempted to sort of tease the audience a little while longer and um, just give you this moment just to say, to defend the idea that the signing of TPP last week was really such an earth shattering event. I mean, does it, once you get past the, pol the, the domestic and international politics of it, does what was signed really matter that much on the substance? Well, okay, first of all, that's like saying besides the, the yeah, besides the assassination attempt, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? Um, All right, but so we've established that, that that TPP is about the politics and and the sort of no. I think it. I think it's also about. The, I think it's about the process and the. I think the process and the substance matter. The process matters in the sense of, you know, the 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 one thing that clearly has animated President Obama the most about TPP was the notion that the U.S. should be at the forefront of setting any standards with respect to trade going forward, as opposed to let's say China. This is the most significant trade agreement that will be signed. If you look at the members involved uh, in 20 years, since essentially the the creation of the WTO, uh, so that's not nothing. And you know, if you look at the stuff that's included, you know, it it affects a wide variety of uh, of economic relationships far beyond trade. It'll probably be one of the templates for TTIP if that's eventually negotiated, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And also, you know, what's interesting is the the evolution of China's attitude about it, which was China used to be sort of dead set against TPP. If you went to any kind of meeting in China from, let's say, 2009 to 2013, they were manic about this. And it's possible they sort of saw the handwriting on the wall and are now, you know, uh, less publicly obstreperous about it. But, you know, they're actually saying all the right things about TPP, including that we might want to join at some point. And in that, if that's the case, then, you know, the, the template actually matters. And then the obvious other way in which it matters, again, is the sort of notion of TPP as a form of soft security, um, signaling these countries that, you know, re reinforcing uh, the, the – and being the economic component of the administration's rebalancing strategy, um, which was articulated very eloquently, uh, I believe, 46 times by uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So this brings us to the relationship between um, trade policy or, or what do we call this? Because, you know, many of the planks of this agreement, as you alluded to, aren't really trade in the classical sense. They, they pertain to intellectual property. They pertain to currency or they don't pertain to currency. So, you know, calling this a trade agreement is a, a little bit of a, a misnomer in the first Let's, place. Well, all right. I mean, if you want to be... First of all, it does still involve things like, you know, traditional things like tariffs. That matters a great deal, particularly if you're talking about, you know, trade with Vietnam. But the second thing is we can call it foreign economic policy or you can call it a trade and integration agreement, although in some ways that's not fair because there's – there that actually – that exists and that, sound, that sounds much less important. Yeah. So I um, promise we're going to get to Hillary, but I want to continue to wonk out for a moment. And just you – know, <laughs> okay. you, you pointed to the evolution of – Chinese attitudes toward yeah. the TPP. And, you know, in parallel, or I would argue preceding that, something else happened, which is, and, and my sense is that um, the U.S. actually got feedback from its Asian partners that an agreement that was framed explicitly as excluding China and as a block to compete with China was not going to be tenable for them. So TPP right. had to be reframed as something that China could eventually join and somewhat mm -hmm. to everybody's surprise, the Chinese have leaned fairly far forward on that. But that had consequences for the substance of the agreement um, and where you had provisions that the U.S. or um, big swaths of the American body politic really wanted, um, you know, above all currency manipulation language that either aren't there or are very weak. And the argument that was made for why it was okay that they were so weak was, well, it has to be possible for China to join. So 
you know, there's an interesting way that the that TPP was sold as geopolitically one thing. It was sold as two different geopolitical things at the same time, which is which is really a neat trick. Although the that's very much the, the nature of U.S. relationship with China is that you're trying to do okay. two somewhat contradictory things at the same time. Right. So my response would be that those two things that you were talking about are also at the contradictory core of the rebalancing strategy yep. um, writ large, which is that the administration's position has always been simultaneously we want to engage China and bring China into, you know, a- have China act as a responsible stakeholder. And yet we also want to make sure that we have a set of structures that are in place in case China should choose not to act like that. Um, and I think TPP in that sense perfectly encapsulates uh, that strategy. The second thing is, is that I would say, particularly on, let's say, the currency uh, components of it, you know, the history of trade agreements that address currency – prior to TPP uh, can be summed up in the word nil. Um, the very fact that even, however modest, and I, we don't know yet because we have, we have to see the actual agreement, but the very fact that my understanding is, is that there actually is a component that addresses currency manipulation in the trade agreement is in and of itself interesting because um, I would not have expected anything on that ex ante, and there might be something. Um, now, something might not be all that substantial, but in some ways – you can argue the very fact that the countries all agree that yes, it should be on the table is interesting. So the um, the uh, the political scientist in me um, mm-hmm. agrees with you. Um, but the dark side, Heather, tell me about the dark. Similarly, side. Similarly, you know the 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 first effort in an Asian context to to really debate and push out there into the public the labor issues. Yeah. is a really interesting thing. And I think the fact that there was so much blowback on some of the issues, um, particularly pharmaceuticals, and that there seemed to have been some changes, although, as you said, right. we, we won't know until we, we see it. Yeah, um, but so having said all of that, let's let's move on to the politics. And the reason yeah. I, I wanted to, to, to sort of talk, wonk out a little bit first is to say, you know, the interesting thing is, the American public is in the exact same place as far as this trying to do contradictory things, right? Because the American public wants to have a good relationship with China, does not want to be in a war with China, wants its kids to go study in China, learn Chinese, compete in a global a global economy. You know, those those are all things that you just get off the charts positive responses for. Right. Um, and, you know, by and large, the American public is is conflicted – skeptical but hopeful on trade doesn't doesn't hate trade you know there is no there is no anti-trade consensus in america um, and and more surprisingly they hate trade less than they did let's say 10 years ago which is interesting given that the financial crisis happened in the interim right but i think if if understanding of how tied to the global economy the us economy is has somewhat lagged reality you know if you think about it 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 caught up over that over that day. yeah i agree yeah. so so there's all of that but there is at the same time, you know, a real visceral belief and a belief that is that is overstated but not completely wrong that the U.S. and particular sectors, regions and workers of particular ages are just massively under siege from the economic marvel that is that is China. And that, you know, that's not. It's again, it's it doesn't explain it only explains what, like a third to a half of the economic dislocation that we've seen in the US over the past couple decades, but it does explain some significant part of it. You know, the fact that it's a factor. Yeah, I, I, it, you'll get me even the free trader to acknowledge it's a factor. Yeah. Yes. You know, that there that there used to be a textile industry and there basically isn't anymore, although textiles are not so much the Chinese fault. Or auto parts is right. another one. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, the American public wants both of those things fixed at the same time. And, you know, since we are so good at producing um, a political class that, that can believe two contradictory things before breakfast, um, I think the the degree of shock, horror, and um, hands throwing up, twisting, wailing, and gnashing of teeth around Clinton coming out against TPP, I just, I don't get that. So let us let us stipulate a couple of things. So <laughs> okay. like, every election this happens. Um, Democrats will remember, and so will Republicans, uh, that you know in two thousand eight, 
Barack Obama, I mean, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton competed to talk about who would... I'm going to renegotiate NAFTA. Who I'm re- going to renegotiate NAFTA more. Right. Yes. And then you, you had that glorious moment where um, Austin Goolsby went to Canada and said, no, of course we're not <laughs> going to do that. Um, but, but you know, and I'm, um, I'm being harder on my own party, but Republicans do the same thing. And this has a glorious yeah. history going back to the 70s and probably earlier than the 70s. So, like, why anyone is more surprised about Hillary Clinton doing it? Well, I have an idea why people are more surprised. I could give you several possibilities, but go ahead. Keep going, and I will. But so, so first thing is this is this is not unprecedented in the annals of whatever. And second, there's a really good tactical political reason why she did it. This I really want to hear. Joe Biden. Right. Okay. It separates. It would. It would. It separates Joe Biden from Hillary if Biden were to enter the race. Well, it does a really specific thing. It okay. makes it impossible for the big unions to get behind Biden and to put their their door-to-door, hands-on, canvassing strength and financial strength behind Biden. It ensures that the unions will at least stay neutral in a primary. Okay. And, you know... That, ladies and gentlemen, it, it may or may not, depending on your view, be lousy international economic policy, but it is primo, tier one, this is what makes American politicians great political thinking. Okay, let me let me offer a rejoinder because I do want to th- – this was my reaction to this, which is not I, – I, I'm willing to be talked out of this is my point, which is first, let's concede politicians talk about – talk smack about trade on the campaign trail – All the time. You're right. In that sense, this is not new. There are, however, two ways in which this is new to me. The first is, is that unlike many of the other examples you are talking about, this is not an instance where someone was a candidate and talks about a deal that they had no responsibility in crafting. Now, this is not to say that Hillary Clinton was in the bargaining room or, you know, the green room hammering out this stuff. But at the same time, you know, as I said, I think Jake Tapper at CNN caught, you know, had 46 times in which Hillary Clinton talked positively about TPP while Secretary of State. Can I just stop where you right there and talk about the difference between talking positively about something and being in charge of it? And can we both reflect, you know, how many times we as observers of administration policy have watched state be on the losing end of international economic policy battles? So let's not, let's not like, um, Let's not overly build up Secretary Clinton as the great genius of TPP. Right. But we can talk about Secretary Clinton because this is one of the things she likes to talk about as being one of the architects of the rebalancing strategy. Mm -hmm. And TPP is the essential economic component of the rebalancing strategy. So I agree with you. It's not like this is her – it's not her baby. But she's an aunt and she's closely related. And furthermore, she had an opportunity post-Secretary of State in her memoirs to – back away from it, and she doesn't do that. Instead, she talks about, you know, and I I blogged about this last week, the notion of there is never going to be a perfect, you know, agreement between 12 countries. You know, that doesn't exist, but this will be a positive first step that maintains high standards. And indeed, that's the logic that I would have assumed Canada Clinton would have adopted. But that's, hold on, that's fine. I understand the political rationale. But in some ways, as you say, this is such a transparently political move that it almost strikes me as self-defeating because I don't think there is a single voter out there that seriously thinks that Hillary Clinton in coming out against TPP now, if she gets elected, once TPP is ratified, and I'm assuming that it's going to be ratified, is going to do anything whatsoever that contradicts TPP. Um, In no small part, again, because she was an advocate for it when she was within the administration. And again, partially this plays into the Clinton persona, I grant you, of of sort of political, you know, political calculus or calculation. But that said, it it is in a way that her moves to the left on, let's say, guns or immigration or others, you know, there's there's a deeper policy rationale that she can make towards that. This feels so transparently political that I actually think it's self-defeating. Well, now, I understand, I understand the union argument that you put forward, and that, I'm glad to hear that because that's, that's, that's the first time I've heard a logical argument that makes sway to me. Although it does raise the question of whether or not Biden's entry is being puffed up a little bit because I still don't think he's actually going to enter the race. But go ahead. Hold, hold – let's let – that, that's a deserving of its own sub-thread. Okay. So first, just to say, 
Um, if you go to union halls, and I am, yeah. I am remaining agnostic on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, and you will note that I went out of my way earlier to say that trade only represents a fraction of the total I understand. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm. I'm not saying this is a a fully correct worldview. Oh God, no, no, of course not. But go ahead. But it is the case that you will find plenty of people who feel very pleased that Clinton made the switch. And here's hmm. this is the okay. other sort of reality of American politics, right? Mm -hmm. That part of having power is actually being able to see somebody do your will, and okay. and you see this. All, you know, frankly, you've been seeing it all the time in an incredibly public way with the Republican Party recently. And we just forget that part of the sort of the ritual of the use and manipulation of power is proving that you have it by having a public official do something. So, so that's, and that, that provides its own kind of power because, you know, I. No, it's like, it's like vote, it's like Congress, you know, listening to APAC on something. You know, I, I, know, I understand that point. That's right. fair. So the other point, and why am I why am I going out of my way to talk about the politics of this here? Okay, so the the difference between this and every presidential candidate who ever before has done an outrageous pander on something. Mm -hmm. One of the differences is that this candidate is female, and. Again, there is also the Clinton family factor. There's the 20 years in the public eye factor. There's the she was secretary of state factor. But there's also just the factor that we are all cultured, acculturated to have a different set of expectations about women's straightforwardness and guilelessness. And we're not used to the idea... Um, TV shows notwithstanding, <laughs> yes, you can you can you can prepare your list of TV rejoinders now, but but we actually have to get used to in real life the idea that we've constructed politics to encourage this kind of behavior, and therefore, if you're going to be a woman in politics, guess what? So I am just I'm making it my personal mission as a female commentator on politics to point out that this is. Uh, from a for policy standpoint, it's a frustrating and hypocritical dance of American political life. From a political, from a purely political standpoint, it's pretty badass. And hey, guess what? Women are badass politicians too. I, I would say two things in response to this. The first is is that my entire adult history of dealing with women, guileless is not the word that I would I'm, first bring up. I'm batting my eyelashes at the camera right now. <laughs> Um, and, and I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that you attract bad women, Dan. <laughs> and then the second is that I, I I am truly awestruck at your ability to turn Hillary's you know conversion of TPP into a somehow this act of brazen political courage. I, I really I, I do admire your jujitsu skills there. But I want to get back to Biden because in some ways um, that that really does. In some ways, I think our, dis our disagreement in part politically is about whether Biden, whether this was a shrewd threat or a shrewd move to basically hamper Biden if he enters the race, which very well might be the case. I I'm perfectly willing to buy that logic. I just don't think he's going to enter the race. Because? It's too friggin' late. It is – this is the – I mean – I mean, there's a number of other reasons, but I think we're getting to the point where, you know, it's mid-October now. Um, and as much as, you know, the, the 2016 dynamic has been that, you know, the, you know, you've got Rubio talking, for example, about how he doesn't want to peak at the right, you know, too soon. The notion that if you enter too early, then you might start to fade. You know, there are certain things you have to do, um, to enter a campaign. Things like, you know, setting up fundraising and petitions to actually get on the ballot and organizing and also being in the debates, the first of which for the Democrats will be tomorrow night. Um, you know, there are other candidates in previous cycles who entered, you know, in August, and that was thought to be late. Think Rick Perry, for example, um, or Fred Thompson in 2008, or I think Wes, Wes Clark, Clark in 2000. Yeah, in 2004. So, you know, yes, Biden is a vice president, and obviously that, that comes with certain, you know, gravitas to it. But he also hasn't had to be a full-blown candidate in quite some time. And, you know, the nature of all of this conversation strikes me as – 
as much him kind of enjoying the the trial balloon aspect of it, I think also in the hopes that 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 Clinton would fade somewhat. And the truth is, is that if you also look at the polls, Clinton has, you know, she, he's she's declined somewhat, but she's actually held her own and in some ways strengthened in some of the national polls and, you know, also demonstrates her organizational strength. So I think I, I understood Biden's sort of trial balloon as a if Hillary continues to deflate, um, then I can step in. But it seems increasingly clear to me that she's not going to deflate. The biggest weakness that she's had is this whole Benghazi business in which the Republicans have magnificently self-destructed and given her plenty of ammunition to counter now. Um, so I, I just don't think he's going to enter. But I'm, I'm willing to hear a counter argument on this because you're closer to, to the ground than I am on this stuff. I mean, you have you have magnificently summarized everything that I would have believed to be correct if we hadn't seen all of the sort of oddness that we've seen over the last few months in the political process. I mean, what you say is how things should, I think, play out if (laughs) the laws of nature continue to hold. But here's here's a counter here's a counter narrative um, that's just kind of interesting to contemplate. And I this came up for me because I was I was chatting about this with my dad, who is a longtime reporter and editor, covered the Chicago Convention in 1968, you know, knows a little something about American politics. And I made to him the argument you or me. He said, Biden's not going to get in now. Biden be crazy to get in now. And I said, well, if Biden's going to get in, he has to get in now because he's going to miss the deadlines for filing for primaries and hiring staff and all the rest of it. And my dad looks at me and says, who needs primaries? And I said, but dad, you have to. I said, you can't, you can't be nominated from the floor anymore. And then he looked at me and he says, are you sure? And. Oh, come on. No, okay. I look, I, like I said, I agree with everything that you said. And I also think that Biden's numbers are highest while he's not in the race. Yes, exactly. And okay, that once Biden on that. gets yeah. in the race, he will come under scrutiny. People will be reminded of, you know, the less than lovable things that he's done in his past. They will be reminded that he's not the best campaigner that God ever placed on this green earth. And his numbers will start to drift downward. Also, he'll pull a Biden at some point. I mean, the the media is the media would be like, you know, a cougar waiting to jump on him the moment he makes his first misstep. The media would be like every cougar who's ever lived on the planet Earth altogether. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so Biden is best off not running both because of, you know, that he sort of continues to float like a like a happy wraith over the debate tomorrow. But also because um, if, I mean, if either anything sort of terrible or catastrophic happened to Clinton or if we were to get to a place next spring and there sort of was a groundswell of some kind, it seems to me that you could at least continue to feed your fantasies yeah, that, that there's a enough. route that there's a route that doesn't in, that doesn't actually involve the drudgery of contesting primaries. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you mentioned there's a Democratic debate tomorrow night. Yes. I was engaging in a in a thought experiment earlier with a, with a reporter from Reuters about sort of questions that the CNN anchors will ask as opposed to questions they should ask. So do we know who, I'm sorry, who are the actual CNN anchors for the debate? Uh, Anderson Cooper uh-huh. and three other people that I don't remember who they are. And I sincerely apologize to them. And I like them all very much, even though I don't remember who they are. <laughs> is, it, do you, is it Jake Tapper or not? You know, I, I want to say not. But okay. again, I, I, I'm viewers, I apologize. I just don't. I understand. Um, so but it's kind of an interview. So, for example, I think, you know. There's probably a question about a Syria no-fly zone because it's – or – Oh, yeah. Whereas in some ways a more interesting question would be what should we do about refugees in the U.S. and what refugees should we do something about? Mm-hmm. So that's sort of my example of question that will get asked versus question that should get asked. You know, is there – is the question – is the Iran question about the nuclear deal? Is it about the Americans who are stuck there? It, imprisoned there? Is it about the missile the Iranians tested yesterday? Or is it not about Iran at all? Is it about the uptick in tension and violence between Israelis and Palestinians? Is the China question about TPP? 
Or is the China question about the naval exercises that have just started with the U.S. sailing within 12 miles of the contested things that aren't really islands? Or will there not even be a China question, which I think is a real possibility? Oh, I, I'm with you on that. My bet would be on no China question. Um, so what else? Uh, so we're talking about questions that, that will not be asked but should be asked. Yeah, or questions – that, that will be asked and you just kind of can't even believe we have to talk about that. Right. Um, well, the questions that will be asked that I don't want to, I, I don't want to deal with, at least from this crew, I guarantee you they're going to ask a question about the, the GOP havoc in the, the house. Um, or at least it'll be asked in the way of how would you as a democratic Senate or president deal with, you know, the, uh, the, the chaos that is the, the houses we are talking about. Um, and that's something that it's, it's a banal question and I'm not really going to be very interested in their answer. Um, actually though, that's one where you could come up with points. I would give points for creativity for that one. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's sort of true. like anyone who says, um, I would give them all medical marijuana and lock them in a room, big points for creativity. <laughs> that's bad. Um, they will ask, a, I'm sure they're going to be asked a question about the GOP presidential, uh, nomination. They'll be asked a question about Trump. Uh, it wouldn't shock me, um, you know, because that's just a total free pass. In terms of questions I would like to hear, but um, I can't remember. Did you say immigration? Um, you know, I didn't. I said refugees. Yeah, I, it wouldn't shock me if there's a question about illegal immigration. Um, and, you know, just because, again, it's it's come up in the, the GOP debate. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of, of substantive foreign policy questions that I would like to hear answered and won't be. I, it, I mean, TPP, I think, is without question, obviously, going to come up. Um, and that's actually, that's that falls into the rare category of questions that should be asked and questions I want to hear the answer to. I guarantee you there will be a question about Israel. Um, it, it, first, because there's now a hook in terms of the rising degree of violence that you're seeing um, in the occupied territories, uh, as well as the more subtle reason of it highlights the fact that this president has not had a great relationship with Israel. Um, therefore, what will the, these uh, candidates do to repair that relationship? And also because I think it suggests that a possible real distinction between uh, what Bernie Sanders will say and what Hillary Clinton will say. Yeah. See, there I think two things. One is I think the media has been so distracted by Iran and Syria that we might actually not get a question on Israel. Okay. Um, and second, um, people are in for a surprise because um, there's an assumption that Sanders is more left on Israel than he actually is. Hmm. Interesting. Um, okay. And perhaps no one is in for more of a surprise than his supporters. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think that'll be that'll be interesting if it happens. Yeah. Um, um, and then, I mean, I wonder, I wonder what Jim Webb will. I mean, it, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me. If the person who says the most surprising thing to hear on stage at a Democratic Party debate on Israel is Jim Webb. I, you know what? Jim Webb, I, I had the pleasure of having to testify in front of Jim Webb uh, once on sovereign wealth funds and nearly got into a shouting match with him on that issue, uh, which is hard to do, frankly. Um, I, 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 you could create your own separate drinking game for Jim Webb alone about what crazy ass stuff he is going to say. I was very surprised to see the Post's preview story describe Webb as relatively subdued. What? Um, that's what they yeah. described? Oh, God, that's just wrong. Yeah. No, PolitiFact needs to – needs to, Glenn Kessler needs to overrule that Post story. So, Gary, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, if – of the, the candidate most likely to produce a Donald Trump, Trump moment, but also the candidate most likely to produce a Rick Lazio moment, by the way, and give – Clinton a massive sympathy boost because he just can't restrain himself from being a little bit That's actually true. If I had to bet, yes, in, in some ways, no, Jim Webb is the crazy, slightly drunk uncle that you you invite to these kinds of things that actually give, build sympathy for the front runner. So Hey, now, be careful what you are saying about my Scots-Irish kinsman. I, yes. I'm sorry, but you know damn well that I'm right about this. Um, well, the other thing that's really interesting that I just was was hearing is that the way they've um, arranged this this the positioning, mm -hmm. Clinton is in the middle and right. Sanders is on one side of her and O'Malley is on the other. So, which is a huge <laughs> boon for O'Malley because the public will actually see him every time the camera pans <laughs> to Clinton. Uh -huh. 
which produces for him, you know, the engine, what's his equivalent of the Trump high five that he can pull off? Maybe I, in some ways, it, it, this is the macro sense I have of this. And again, this is my, me, the political scientist, and you can correct me on this. I think in some ways the biggest gift to Hillary Clinton is the fact that of all the possible challengers to Hillary Clinton, it's Bernie Sanders that has developed the momentum. Um, because the thing about Martin O'Malley was is that he was potentially a credible general election candidate. Uh, and so, and, and yet he's gone absolutely friggin' nowhere. Um, and so... You know, I mean, you're right that in some ways there's only one direction for O'Malley to go. Um, but if he doesn't get a bump out of this debate, I would assume that he drops out sometime in the next month. Because otherwise, well, what's he, the point? And he, you know, on our issue set, this is interesting because he has he has some quite serious national security people around him. And they um, it didn't get a lot of notice, but they did give a speech that was fairly specific and critical of Clinton on a number of points. Now, it's hard to it's hard to make that argument with a lot of credibility when you've been a governor of a small state, but they have made the effort. So so it wouldn't surprise me if he came in sort of ready with some specific points, although again, I, I don't on big questions, I don't know where he's gonna disagree with her. You know, he's gonna be stuck in the same kind of political versus policy no man's land on TPP. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't Anyway, I, I so, mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's, I assume he would probably hit her on Syria, but um, well, but I'm not sure from which side he would hit her on Syria. <laughs> it's interesting because which in and of his, itself is telling, by the way. Well, and this, you know, this gets at actually sort of the the interesting, the reason that there aren't screaming, hair pulling, you know, the kinds of debates that you're having in the in the GOP is that you know there are big differences of opinion in the Democratic Party on trade on intervention, but they don't line up really neatly. And so, for example, O'Malley's advisors, O'Malley's advisors would, I think, tend to be more activist on Syria. They would tend to be more like where Clinton is. Hmm. But if you're looking at what the Democratic base is telling pollsters, that's, you know, if you're if you're yeah, developing poll-driven policy positions, that ain't where you're going. Yeah, I agree. So, so it'll, that'll be be interesting to see. Should we actually should we actually pivot and talk about the region itself for a little I think while? we should. That would actually be appropriate. Have we gazed at our navels long enough? I think we well also we've we've gone over two minutes on Martin O'Malley and let's face it, we've lost whatever viewership. Hey, was. hey, come on. He was my governor and before he was my governor, he was mayor of Baltimore and I used to go here and play the guitar on St. Patrick's Day. So that ten second blog was brought to you by the Martin O'Malley is a relevant candidate. Uh, <laughs> super fact. Look, I live in Maryland. I have to go on living in Maryland. Okay, fair enough. Go ahead. Anyway, we had some interesting events actually in the Middle East this week. Yes. Uh, so where to begin on this one? Uh, Russia decided that it was obviously uh, going to take an active approach uh, to the Syrian intervention, which led to – uh, a few things happening. First, uh, Russian airstrikes against, it would seem, every actor in Syria except ISIS, uh, every non-state actor in Syria except ISIS. So the obvious uh, strategy would seem to be, and this is clearly part of a coordinated uh, a action with Syria's army and with Russian naval uh, forces, as well as a cruise missile launch um, to uh, for Syrian forces to regain territory. In the area, uh, I would say the results have been somewhat mixed to date. I've, I've seen reports of cases where rebels pulled out of a city, the army came in, and then the rebels counterattacked, uh, taking the city back. And there was also the small matter of Russian cruise missiles uh, not landing in the country they were aimed at, um, and that instead of landing in Syria, they apparently landed in Iran. Um, yeah. For those of you who have not spent a significant swath of your life studying the Russian armed forces, welcome to our world. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, um, um, and this suggests, by the way, something that I have been writing about for you know since the uh, since Russia launched its its uh, incursion into Syria, which is to say that Russia is going to look its most powerful at the very moment that it launches the incursion. It can only go downhill from there. Like Joe Biden, exactly. Yes, Russia is in that sense like Joe Biden, which, which actually brings me back to to a point that I made kind of to a tiresome extent on Twitter. But you know, there is nothing like stray missiles wandering over the Middle East, coming close to the territories of various American treaty allies and other allies, to sort of concentrate the mind about who you want in the Oval Office. And yeah. Oh, that, that, that right, and who that reminds don't me that. That reminds me that Russian, uh, you know, air uh, actions over Syria also 
att- potentially wound up in Turkish airspace as well. It's just our NATO ally. It's not a big deal. Um, but uh, I, I'm sure I missed other events that happened. Right. Well, the point, I mean, the, the, the one sort of point I would add to your, to your news summary is that the, you know, the Russians do appear to have a fairly clear strategy and it doesn't appear to have very much to do with ISIS. It, it appears right. to have a lot to do with areas where, um, rebel groups were making significant inroads on things that Assad wants to hold on to. Right. And it suggests now, why they decided to act, which was that the, the Assad regime had a very bad summer in terms of holding on to territory. Yeah. And this is clearly designed to correct that. And there's a very interesting piece in the post today, by the way. Um, you know, we've had a lot of um, stories about the sort of um, painful failure of the Pentagon's effort to arm and train Syrian opposition forces. And the Russians apparently killed several of them Mm -hmm. um, last week. But, you know, all the time that gets talked about, there's also been this parallel CIA CIA program. And it looks like, and uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember the 1980s, yes, I really am going to say this. It looks like the CIA has been handing out missiles. And it looks like those missiles have been very effective and that it looks like the Russians are aiming their assault in places where, coincidentally, there are also lots of rebels with lots of this somewhat more sophisticated equipment that the CIA has been handing out. Yeah, I'm just getting over my deja vu moment there for a second. Yeah, okay. yeah, you're humming to yourself. His story <laughs> never repeats. <laughs> I tell myself before I go to sleep. I mean, I guess the, the you know, as I said, the inter- I guess the, the key question is whether or not this, for lack of a way of putting it, Russian surge uh, of men and materiel uh, to aid and abet uh, Syria's army will actually have a decisive effect on the ground. Um this is beyond my policy remit. I color me skeptical on this because uh, it, in the end, does require Syrian forces to do something. Uh, but I'm curious about your take. Well, you know, two things. I mean, in the end, it requires ground forces. Right. And are the Russians really going to surge in significant numbers of ground troops? Interestingly, um, Russian public opinion polling suggests that this isn't super popular. That no, it's the, not popular the, at all. The Russian yeah. public was very down with the idea of doing whatever it took to pr- protect supposedly beleaguered fellow language speakers in Ukraine, and the Russian public is not down with this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Putin will face ultimately some limitations on what he can do, and, you know, ultimately it's hard to believe that he's going to have any more success with air power than than the U.S. has, frankly, had with air with air power up to now. I think the other thing... He says, and I think it's reasonable, I mean, Russia is worried about ISIS. Russia does have a major problem of its citizens joining ISIS, trying to come home. So, you know, Putin is concerned about ISIS. He clearly believes that Assad is the long-term answer to ISIS. Right. And, you know, but can you get... And that's the fundamental disagreement with the U.S. The U.S. clearly believes that Assad in aids and abets the Korean, you know, through, through its existence, helps to sustain ISIS. Yep. And there you have, by the way, a very nice distillation of the difference in thought between the two systems. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess my question is, to what extent are you concerned about a legitimate, you know, actual era, you know, some sort of conflict between Russian and American forces, either because Russian forces stray over into Turkish airspace or because, um, you know, Russian and and U.S. uh, fighters are engaged in operations over Syria or what have you? That does strike me as a legitimate and valid concern. It's a very serious concern, and yeah. you could sort of go on listing. I mean, imag- like I say, imagine one of those Russian missiles had landed in Turkey. Right. Um, imagine a missile is detected coming from the neighborhood of Iran going toward Israel. Just stop yeah. and think about that for a second. Yeah. Right? You know, imagine if, if it instead of crashing in Iran or hooking north toward Turkey, it hooks south. And you're sitting somewhere in Israel, and you say, well, we have this thing on the incoming radar, and... You know, hopefully we can tell that it was launched in Russia and not launched in Iran. But, you know, I that's that's not the kind of day I would I would like to have were I an Israeli or an American policymaker. You want to talk about deja vu. I was a research assistant for Scott Sagan back in the day. And all I can think of is Sagan's book, The Limits of Safety, which is all about the um, the near nuclear accidents that both the United States and the Soviet Union had during the Cold War, many of which revolved around some radar installation misinterpreting something as potentially an incoming nuclear strike. 
Isn't there a famous one involving a flock of birds? Uh, there is one. I don't remember the flock of birds. There is one in which uh, during the middle of the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a, uh, a proximity alarm at a nuclear base in Minnesota, I believe, um, which suggested the alarm that went off was one that suggested a saboteur. Uh, was there. And according to the DEF CON they were at, they were supposed to scramble bombers and, you know, get ready to launch. Um, fortunately, the I believe the, the base guards detected uh, what the source of the incursion was. And it was, and I kid you not, a bear. My only question was bear or moose, really. Yeah, it was bear. But I mean, that's the perfect symbolism for the story. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, you know, the possibility of an accidental uh, conflict, you know, or an accidental um uh, loss of life due to this is just incredibly high. It makes, I think I, I wrote something last week listing my 10 concerns about this, about Russia's incursion into Syria. And I think eight of them involved an accidental skirmish. Yeah. Well, you know, the other sort of the other whole vector here to talk about is that Iran is continuing to send weapons for Hezbollah through Syria. And up to now, the yeah. Israelis have been conducting very carefully targeted strikes. When they see something moving through Syria that they particularly don't like, they go in and take it out. Right. Um, that is a whole hell of a lot more complicated with Russian fighter jets there yeah, and yeah. with the clarity that Russia and Iran are working together. Mm -hmm. So if you're the Israelis, you're, you're pinched in a very – in a way that you are not at all accustomed to being pinched in this part of the world. And you can see by the, the high-level – the intensity of high-level traffic between um, Israel and Moscow of the sort of both sides – trying to to figure to figure this one out and yeah. but i don't there's not there's not a lot of reason for optimism that this all this all works itself out well yes not to mention that there was the iranian missile test which i believe was yesterday yes yes we uh, should and the iranians do seem to know how to launch a missile and have it go where they want it to go we which should. you know is above average for the region oh and then there was of course the saudis response to all of this which is not going to end well for russia either i would add um it's not like you know the saudis have reacted uh, in an even more uh, angry way, you could argue, than the Israelis have. Well, and what that does, again, is if your view is that whether us whether Assad has to go before you work out a future of the region or whether Assad has to go in the process of working that out, um, the degree of hostility that the Saudis have to the Russian presence makes the day where you can have um, the relevant players sit down and say, okay, what does the future look like? It yeah. puts that day farther off. Yes. Um, um, there was, I should, I should say one last thing, which is that there was a really terrific piece um, on NPR over the weekend, an interview with uh, Thanasi Kambanis, who mm -hmm. sit, sits at the Century Foundation and had actually been into Damascus, had been on a government sponsored trip to, to Syria huh. um, and was just back. And, you know, his, his comment was that um, people in regime controlled areas, and he had regime minders with him everywhere he went, so right. you know, he didn't get anything very spontaneous. But people said their thought about it was not that they were happy that the Russians were there, but that they were really desperately hoping that the arrival of the Russians meant that finally this would be over. <laughs> Which, you know, if you know anything about the history of, of Russian intervention or indeed great power intervention, the moment that the great power shows up is very rarely the moment that things are finally over. Yeah. Um, no, it reminds me of the when the military shows up in the show Fear the Walking Dead. Um, so I should have, I should have known this was going to come back to Fear the Walking. We were Dead. talking. Well, we agreed we were going to talk about Armageddon in the Middle East, and it's now time, I believe, to pivot and talk about Armageddon in the House of Representatives, uh, which is to say, um, I don't know what happened today, but basically, since John Boehner uh, announced that he was going to step down as Speaker uh, last week, uh, Kevin or two. Yeah, last week, Kevin McCarthy. It's only last week. Yeah. I know. Last week, uh, Kevin McCarthy announced that he was not uh, – he was ostensibly going to become speaker and announced that he was stepping aside. Uh, there is now a full court press by the entire GOP establishment, I believe, to get Paul Ryan to take the job. Paul Ryan uh, apparently is resisting that. And every day that Paul Ryan holds out, by the way, my estimation of Paul Ryan's intelligence goes up. Um, I cannot tell you the way in which Paul Ryan has gone up in my eyes because he knows that that job is a dead bang loser in, in many, many ways. Um, so, Heather, I, not that, you know, you necessarily know the the uh, the players involved in, among the Republicans, but how the hell is this going to end? Well, just to agree with you about Ryan and that what I find mystifying is why 
the GOP establishment is so eager to throw, you know, one of its very brightest stars into this volcano. Yeah. Um, that why you don't want to save Ryan for after Armageddon finally arrives and you either sort of um, retain, re- regain control over your party or you split your, you, you have some kind of outcome, which clearly the next speaker is not going to be able to produce. So, right. you know, what did you it, watch, what, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Did you watch Meet the Press yesterday? Uh, no, I watched people's Twitter about about it. I mean, holy crap! I caught I didn't catch much of it, but I caught enough of. I think David Bratton, I can't remember who the other, the more establishment member of the House was on it. Yeah. I, you know, I have never seen a Republican and Democrat get into that nasty of an argument on yep. a Sunday morning talk show. That was just. I mean, it was ugly to watch. It really was. Yeah. Um, and if that's the kind of you know, if that's the caucus that whoever becomes speaker has to oversee. You know, again, props to Paul Ryan for for holding out for something. Well, you know, if people haven't seen, um, Politico published a document which was allegedly the list of things that um, that McCarthy was asked to promise he would do mm-hmm. um, in order to get the support of the Freedom Caucus, and you know, they they vary from the you know they all sort of require a suspension in one's belief of gravity, <laughs> um, basically. And then you know, my favorite was the and you will oppose outside groups from running ads against us when we do things you don't like. <laughs> Which, I, you know, I read that and I thought, well, gee, I want a pony too. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, it, the House Freedom Caucus has become the free – we should just relabel them the Free Pony Caucus. The Free Pony Caucus. So, you know, either – I mean, and I – the signals I read, I, I – and I, again, I'm, I'm a little out of – it's interesting that there hasn't been much public today. Yeah. But okay, my, so there hasn't been. I hadn't seen anything yet. My read on it, honestly, is that Ryan was eventually going to knuckle under and do it. And so it may be that what he's doing today is trying to impose some terms. Yeah, which I would – I mean you know what, the one thing that strikes me as more plausible is not that Ryan agrees to do it uh, ad infinitum, but that he agrees to do it for the rest of this term. Um, with the with the expectation that he would then return to ways and means that he would mm. be able to serve as an interim speaker, and in return for that, he will be able to get the things that actually have to get done done. Um, mm. Which is a related question I was going to ask you, which is weirdly, um, given the chaos that's going on, I mean, one of the more interesting things that happened in the House um, was that about forty or so moderate members of the GOP, relatively moderate members of the GOP, cooperated with the Democrats to get. Uh, a discharge petition out for the import export bank or the export import bank. And this gave me, this did lead me to wonder about the following, which is Boehner is on his way out. There are just as many moderates as there are members of the house freedom caucus. If I'm a GOP moderate, why don't I threaten that unless the house freedom caucus knuckles under, we will in fact cooperate with the Democrats, not on actual substantive policy stuff, but rather on things like lifting the debt ceiling. And just passing like a one year continuing resolution. In other words, basically stuff that allows the government to function and prevents the U.S. from defaulting on its debt. Well, what you have seen to date is that the small, relatively small nucleus of the Freedom Party plus the larger group of members and and donors who are sort of somewhat loosely affiliated um, have been able to make everybody else sufficiently scared of primarying. Mm-hmm. Um, that nobody has been willing to do anything that they think would lead to the ire of, of that yeah. community. Mm-hmm. And I've been watching over the last, however it is, four or five days now, for any signs that that changed, mm-hmm. that, we had, that we had finally reached the point where sort of a significant number of members were willing to say, well, you know what, yeah, go ahead and primary me because I think I'll win because the yeah. public – sees that this is crazy. Right. And I have to say, I don't think we've actually reached that point. Okay, but or, wouldn't the ex bank example I, contradict that, though? Or, I, I mean, go ahead. Um, I think there was a judgment that that was a, not a big enough deal. Okay. Whereas the debt ceiling is a huge symbolic deal. You know, there, one of the conditions that was presented to McCarthy was no lifting the debt ceiling without entitlement reform. <laughs> Which, again, like, you know, I could have a whole herd of ponies. Right, exactly. Um, um, and also a castle to keep them in. 
I don't get the lack of look. I, I think this is, this is the part. And in some ways it's worth stepping back here because in some ways the one commonality about everything we're talking about is the gap between what we would think of as sort of rational courses of political action. And here I'm not talking about whether I agree ideologically with members of the House Freedom Caucus, but literally the notion of if you game out what strategies you pursue, you know what will eventually happen. So you would think that the previous go-rounds on the debt ceiling would lead members of the House Freedom Caucus to understand that in the end they are not going to win. And that in the end, there is going to be further knuckling under. And it, in some ways, it actually ties into something internationally that Jeremy Shapiro said in an interview, I think, on Vox about why the U.S. was caught so flat-footed on Putin's intervention in Syria. And I actually think this is correct, which is one of the reasons they were caught flat-footed was that the intervention in Syria made no sense from the Russian perspective. Um, in that, yes, it led to a few short-term gains, but the obvious long-run outcome was not going to be was going to be so bad for Russia that surely the Russians would realize that. And so interestingly, I think you have this situation where you've got enough political actors out there that actually haven't gained things out. So they're going what the, the political science language for this is off the equilibrium path. And because they're going off the equilibrium path, we're in parts unknown that surprise even, you know, those who know how these games play. I actually want to defend the rationality of the, of the Freedom Party approach a little bit. Freedom Caucus. Excellent. I finally got you into something where I'm going to make you do this. Go. <laughs> um, so they have succeeded in getting and keeping sequester. Yeah. And they have succeeded in extracting for every small raise of the caps sort of further, further – cuts down the road, further lowering of, of, of limits down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something, frankly, you know, you and I, I'm sure there's a video somewhere of you and I saying sequester is so ridiculous, of course it won't happen. Oh, that we the, the, and it's true. The reason the sequester was originally set up was because the outcome was thought to be so ridiculous that eventually Republicans and Democrats would cooperate. You're absolutely right. That's a fair so point. So if yeah. you are a member of the Freedom Caucus, if you and if even more importantly, perhaps if you are a donor mm -hmm. sitting back home somewhere else, you say, well, you know, people said this couldn't be done and we did it. People said this couldn't be done and we did it. And every day that we hamstring the government and prevent it from doing more stuff mm -hmm. is a good day. Which So our job is just to keep hamstringing every way we can. Okay, but and that, that is a that like yeah. That's not a philosophy of governance that I like. It's not a philosophy of governance that's really compatible with the U.S. Constitution the way I read it. Mm -hmm. But it's a coherent philosophy that can lead to strategic consequences not entirely unlike what we have seen. I guess my answer to that is twofold. The first is, is that while you're right that the sequester was gotten through, in some ways that was the, the high point of this strategy, that if you take a look since then, I'm not sure they've gotten nearly as much. In fact, they've gotten diminishing marginal returns with this gambit each and every time they've tried it after that. The second thing is that, again, John Boehner is now an endgame strategy for John Boehner, which is it doesn't really matter what he does uh, in terms of his political fortunes, which – you know, and, and the scariest thing in Washington is a politician with, that has nothing to lose. You know, couldn't it be the case that Boehner, be, precisely because he knows he's on his way out, actually eliminate the debt ceiling as an issue from the House Freedom Caucus, thereby in some ways neutering them? I, I just keep talking to people who sort of are hoping that will happen, and I just – I confess I'm hoping it will happen. Yeah, no, and it's it's a very sort of middle of the road journalist. It's so obvious that this is what should happen that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I just don't I mean, I hope I'm I hope to be wrong, mm -hmm. but I don't see there being critical mass for it. And and I should also say that it's worth noting that the numbers of the House Freedom Caucus are growing. Mm -hmm. So, you and I may think that their strategy has brought them diminishing returns, but you know, they have now bagged a speaker and no, they I, have bagged a speaker nominee. So from their perspective, right. no, to be you know, yeah. no, 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 you, no, might, I, you might see it differently. I guess the way I would phrase it is, is that I don't, I don't think these the members of the House Freedom Caucus are vulnerable in their districts. I don't think they're necessarily going to suffer in terms of re-election. I do wonder, though, whether in the parts of the country that do not elect House Freedom Caucus members, um, even on the Republican side, whether they've the, the brand has become sufficiently toxic precisely to – 
allow these people to take more moderate action. But I take your point that they, in some way, as I said, what I am asking is a such a moderate of the road, you know, gang of 500 prediction that it hasn't come to pass yet. So I could be wrong. You're right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I think that, that to say is that I think we may have to go through an election cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, and have some marginal people who were affiliated ever so slightly with the Freedom Caucus or who played footsie with it lose, Mm -hmm. or to have some people who refuse, you know, exactly when you vote for the Exim Bank and nothing happens to you. And there's kind of a demonstration effect that nothing happens to you. And then over time, you, you sort of start to, start to climb, climb your way back. Well, on that note, it has on been that note, it's been fun talking Armageddon domestically and internationally with you as always. Yes, and, and uh, see you see you tune in next month. Same Armageddon. <laughs> exactly. I look same, forward to yeah. same channel, same Armageddon. All right, take care, Heather.